Good morning. I want to tell you about a little buddy I have who lives in my house. His name is Clark. Clark stays in the corner and every day when I leave, I tell him to clean all of the floors. I tell him I'd like him to go in every single nook and cranny. So Clark does that. He works until he is all tuckered out and then he goes back into the corner. Now most of you by now know that Clark is a shark, the little robot vacuum cleaner that we, some of us have to be able to clean the floor so we don't have to. But what if you didn't know that? What if you really thought that Clark was a person? Our culture says that that's what he is, that, that not a person, but that he's a vacuum cleaner. And so we're okay with that. But perhaps in a different time era or a different culture who doesn't know about this robotic vacuum cleaner that is amazing, perhaps they would think that I'm really treating somebody this way. They would think I'm a terrible person. But when we give more information about the story, things start to come to light. That's what I hope to do with Genesis chapter 16. So I hope that at the end of this message, you'll have a new perspective on the cultural aspects of Genesis 16 and what's really going on. So grab your Bibles, turn to Genesis, the first book of the Bible. In number uh, 16, we're going to learn about Abram, Sarai, and Hagar. Now, um, 16 starts out with the plot of our story. Uh, chapter 16, verse 1 says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Right there, that kind of sets the entire plot. She and Abram had been married for quite some time. She was well advanced in years. In fact, when God first gave Abram the promise of a child, uh, it says Abram was about 75, which means that Sarai was about 65 at the time. So they had had this promise of a child. And the story goes on to say that Sarai, after 10 years of having this promise, which would make her about 75, finally said to Abram, you know, God has promised you children, but not through me. So why don't you go ahead and take my maid, Sarah, uh, Hagar, marry her, and maybe I can have children through her. So Abram agrees. He takes Hagar as his wife, and she conceives. Now, not much long after she conceives, she starts to despise her mistress, Sarai. And she, she um, doesn't behave the way that she did before. Now, Sarai disapproves of this blames Abram. Abram says, she's in your hands. Do what you want. So Sarai mistreats Hagar and Hagar runs away. And then Hagar is met at the spring that she stopped at in her flight by the angel of the Lord. Now we're going to get into that a little bit later, but let's think about what's going on in this big picture first. A, prom a child was promised to Abram and Sarai in chapter 12, verse 2. I don't know if you'll remember that from our previous messages, but God promised Abram a nation, a great nation. And then he backs it up again in chapter 15, verse 4. He says, um, when Abram is talking about, well, I have no heirs, and the only person that's going to inherit everything is a manservant born into my household. And God says, no, this servant will not be your heir. But look at the stars of the sky. If you can number them, then you will be able to number your offspring. So there's a second backing up of the promise God has given to Abram. And then it says that Abram believed him and it was counted to him as righteousness. So they're counting on this promise. Now, culture dictated Sarah's initiative. Verse 2 goes on to say that Sarah said, the Lord has kept me from having children. Now, we know in studying the Mesopotamian culture and in some of the archaeological finds, we have found that in the patriarchal system, lineage was so important that they would actually have marital contracts that would state that if the woman could not produce an heir, that it was her responsibility to put in a surrogate somewhere along the lines. It was the woman's responsibility to make it happen that their lineage would continue. 
So this was often done by finding either a concubine or allowing the husband to marry a second wife or a third or fourth. And so you have this cultural understanding that this is Sarah's responsibility. Now this is backed up by some of the archeological finds, like I said. So we have the Sumerian laws of Urnamu and they, they are dated to be about 2000 to 2044 BC. Now, we are not quite sure when Abraham and Sarah uh, had this um, relationship, but it was approximately way before AD. So we know that dating uh, these things, these archaeological finds, was a premise for the Mesopotamian culture. There's another um, archaeological find that was the Babylonian law. That was a little bit um, past the first one they found. And then there's also the Haran Law at Nuzi, and that was approximately 250 BC. So all of these stated that an infertile wife, it was her responsibility to make sure that the lineage of her husband continued on through some sort of surrogacy. So many commentators would suggest that Genesis chapter 16 is actually a faltering of Sarah and Abraham in their faith. God had promised a child and they just were impatient and they didn't wait. And so it was an impetuous decision for Sarai to give her servant Hagar. Now let's back up a little bit. We know that the culture states it's the woman's responsibility. We also know that Sarai is now 75 years old, 10 years God had promised them a child, an heir. So in Sarai's mind, perhaps she was thinking it's my responsibility and the only reason that Abram doesn't have an heir is because I haven't stepped into my responsibility as a wife to provide him a surrogate mother. And so for 10 years, she might have struggled with this decision. It took her that long to finally relent her position as the matriarch of the family and be willing to share it with her Egyptian slave. Now that's doing a couple things. It's taking away Sarai's position. It's also taking away her maid. It's also taking away her husband. There is bound to be jealousy there. There is a reason why God says one man and one woman and no others in between their relationship. And we see that playing out here in Genesis chapter 16. So when the commentators suggest that Sarah and Abram were impetuous and they just didn't wait for God, I would suggest to you to think twice about that. Cultural, uh, culture dictated Sarah's initiative. God did not condemn it. In fact, we will see later that this was actually blessed. Sarah gave Hagar to Abram as his wife. She understood that it shouldn't just be some uh, physical relationship. She understood that there should be some connection there. And it says that she gave Abram an isha naushim. That means wife. And it says Abram took her into his embrace, took Hagar into his embrace. So up to the point where Hagar conceived and then started despising her mistress, there was some sort of relationship going that they were all three amicable to each other. Now, then comes the issue, right? So the issue with Hagar conceiving, in Hagar's mind, she was a lowly servant. In fact, nobody would have even addressed her or spoken to her unless they needed something. No dignitaries ever spoke to the servants beneath them. And here she had been elevated to be right alongside the matriarch of the family. And she was feeling some animosity towards Sarai because perhaps Sarai wasn't elevating her completely to where she thought she needed to be. So therein lies the difficulty. You know, if you also think about this situation, how long should they have waited for God's promise? Now, I'm not suggesting that we move forward ahead of God, but what I am suggesting is sometimes it's time to move. And they had waited 10 years for this promise for God to, to have come to fruition. It's kind of like that joke that we probably all have heard about the man who drowned in a flood. And when he got to heaven, he asked God, I prayed for you to save me. And why didn't you save me? And God said, I sent you, first of all, the evacuation notice that you should have got out. Second of all, I sent you a boat when it was getting too high. And third of all, I sent you a helicopter when you were sitting on the roof of your house and the water was rising. <laughs> 
I did try to save you. How long was Sarai supposed to wait? God knew the culture. He allowed for the tension to happen. This was God's plan being fulfilled. It was a sequence of events that needed to take place in order to reach the end goal. Isaiah 46, 11 says, What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. And we can count on that. What God tells us he will do, he will do. God would just use this in his plan. See, we have in our life and on earth, we have a permissive will of God and we have a perfect will of God. The permissive will of God will take everything that comes across our plate and make it for our good. Scripture tells us that everything will work towards the good of those who are called according to God's name. We are called according to God's name. We are called according to his purposes. And so everything we do in life, whether it be a poor decision or God's decision, for his perfect will, will come to fruition to be good for our lives, for our spiritual and eternal lives. That we can rest on because that God has promised that he will do. That which he has said he will do, he will do. God would use this towards his plan. There's a missionary that was named Jim Elliott, and he felt that he was called to the Hurani tribe. They were also called the uh, Aku's tribe, which means savage. They were named savage by their neighbors. So for two years, he and a group of his missionary buddies spent trying to make um, a break into this culture and try to make friends with them. They started dropping uh, care packages from helicopters because they were such a savage tribe. They needed to develop a relationship before they actually approached them. On the day that they had, were going to approach them, two years after starting to build this relationship, uh, 10 warriors from the Harani tribe came and they killed every single one of those five missionaries. Their bodies were found floating in the river a few days later. Now, was it God's purpose for that tribe to be evangelized? Absolutely. His Jim's wife, Elizabeth, went there shortly after. She took their two and a half year old daughter to the tribe. The tribe embraced her. They recognized that they had wronged her. They brought her into the tribe and she lived with them for about five years. They taught her the language. They even gave her a tribal name. She evangelized that tribe. Now, was it God's plan for Jim to be killed? We don't understand the plans of God. But we do know that God will work everything to the good of those called according to his name. Now, Jim's in heaven. We know that. Yay for him. He won. But Elizabeth was able to use that to be able to witness to the tribe. It was a terrible event, but God used it for his good. So going back to Abram, Sarai, and Hagar, this was not a terrible event. A child is never a terrible event. God loved Hagar. We're going to look at the promises that he gave to her. God loved her son Ishmael. God blessed her son Ishmael because it was also the son of Abram. And he had promised Abram that he will bless his lineage. So Ishmael, Hagar's son, is the father of all the Arabs. Now we think, oh, that was terrible. Had, had that never happened, we wouldn't have Arabian people. Well, let's look at the Arabian people for a minute. They have been so instrumental in many of God's plans. The descendants of Ishmael bought Joseph and delivered him to Egypt. Joseph interpreted the king's dreams that there would be famine and saved the entire world. That's in the end of Genesis, if you want to check that out. The people of Ishmael are known for their wisdom. When Solomon's wisdom was compared, it was compared to the wisest people on earth. It was compared to the people of the East, which were the descendants of Ishmael. They were very wise people. Two kings, one of Agar and one of Lemuel, also descendants of Ishmael, they wrote the last two chapters in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30 and 31. And women, if you are watching this, you know that Proverbs 31 is the, the one chapter of the Bible that we put our standards as wives up to. Those were written by the descendants of Ishmael. Yes, they wrote part of the Bible. 
The Midianites were also descended from Ishmael. I don't know if you remember the Midianites, but Moses married a Midianite, Zipporah. And on his way to rescue the Israelites from Egypt, she saved his life. A descendant of Ishmael. Very instrumental in God's plan. And furthermore, her father, Jethro, which would have been Moses' father-in-law, met them in the desert. And he instituted the very first organizational chain of command. He was a very wise man, and he gave his wisdom freely. What about the Magi? Do you remember the wise men that came to give, pay tribute to Jesus as he was a babe? Those were descendants of Ishmael. There are Arabian Christians. Yes, they are part of the kingdom of God too. And so when we look at uh, Ishmael, he was not a mistake. He was not somebody's fleshly uh, intuition to try and make God's plan happen. He was part of God's plan. So let's look at the individual picture. Let's look at Hagar herself. Now it says that Hagar despised her mistress, Sarai, and Sarai mistreated her, hence the reason for Hagar fleeing. So if we want to skip over all of the theological weeds of identity and questions and all of this stuff, we can really get to the heart, other than to say that as a maid, she was never addressed by any dignitary, as we said before. So in her plight and in her um, pause at the spring in the desert, an angel of the Lord came to her and spoke to her. This was huge for Hagar. It says in verse uh, 7, of chapter 16. Now the angel of the Lord found her, this is Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? He addressed her and furthermore, he wanted to dialogue with her. He opened up that dialogue by asking her questions. So the instruction that he gave her after she had told him, I'm Hagar, I'm fleeing, the instruction he gave her in verse 9, it says, Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself into her hand. Now that doesn't really sound comforting. But then there's a promise that backs it up. Verse 10 says, Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. That's the same blessing that he's going to give to Abram. He had already given some blessings prior, but the verbiage that he used to give to Hagar that blessing, he would in the very next two chapters give to Abram himself. I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. Now this tells us a couple things. First of all, that God is no respecter of positions. It doesn't matter if you're on the lowest rung of the totem pole or if you're on the highest high rise penthouse. God will speak to you when you need to hear him. It also says that God will bless both here and here. To God, it doesn't matter. People are people. And he loves us dearly. The Lord heard her affliction. He came to her and in her time of distress and he said, you need to go back. He gave her instruction and then he gave her blessing. If we hear God, he will give us the same instruction and blessing. And he gave her a blessing. He continued to say, you're with child and I want you to name his name Ishmael because God hears. Ishmael means God hears. So not only did he come to her in person and let her see that God heard her, he also said, I want you to remember for the rest of your life, for the rest of your son's life, that I hear you. This was a remembrance. This was more than an altar. This would be her life. God hears. This was God showing his love for her. It was also be a reminder to Ishmael himself. Now, eventually we'll read in a little bit, in a couple more chapters, and I hope that you read this on your own. Ishmael and his mother, when uh, Ishmael was about 15 or 16, uh, they eventually did have to go into the desert. And there was a time that they thought they would die. God came to them again because God heard Ishmael's cry. And that's talked about in chapter 21. God heard Ishmael. God named him God hears and God followed up that which 
I have said I will do, I will do. God's backing that up. So then he goes on, and oftentimes we can look at this promise that he gave to Hagar, and we can say, well, that's really stinky. I don't think I want that kind of a blessing, because he says um, in verse 11, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. Very uplifting. We like that part. But he goes on and he says, He should be a wild man, and he shall his hand shall be against every man, and every man hand will be against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Hmm, I don't know if I would like that kind of a son. But what God said is that he shall be a wild donkey of a man. Now that wild donkey, they were prized. They were looked to because they ran free. They were majestic. So God is blessing Hagar. Remember, Hagar is a slave. She has never tasted freedom. She is running because she was abused by her mistress. And God's telling her, your son will not be in bondage. Your son will be free. But it's also a prophecy. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. But the blessing lies and he will dwell with his brethren. He will not be an outcast. So this was a blessing to Hagar. Her son would taste freedom. Hagar went on in verse 13 and she said, I am going to name this place El Roy which means that God sees. So not only did God hear her, told her to name her son, God hears. God also saw her. And she said, have I also seen him? Have I also seen him? Those are some of the questions that we ask ourselves in times of distress. God hears us in times of distress. We are told that here in this story. This is the individual picture of this story. We've seen the overall picture with the Arabs and the descendants of Ishmael. Now the individual picture in this story is God hears, God sees in all of our lives, in every aspect of our life, in the good times and the not so good times. No matter the circumstance, even if we've created the turmoil ourselves, God hears the afflicted. He sees the hurting. He will be seen if we're diligently looking. That's God's promise too. He says that um, those who diligently seek him will not be disappointed. Psalms 116. Now this is a passage that bears going to in your Bible. So if you have your Bible, open up to the very middle, which would be the book of Psalms. Find chapter 116. Now if you look at the very first verse, it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Verse 2 says, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Now, let's look at that word, he has inclined his ear. What does that mean? It means this, hmm, I'm listening. It comes from the, the Hebrew word natah, and it means stretch out or bend, to pitch a tent. Imagine God pitching a tent right next to you so that when you utter his name, he is right there. He hears you. He sees you. He has pitched a tent next to you. He inclines his ear to you. Luke 12, 7 says, why even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not. God knows every single hair on your head. Psalms 139. Now it's uh, just a few pages past Psalms 116. Now I'm only going to read a few verses to you because uh, we don't have time, but they're super exciting. Psalms 139 should be the psalm of our heart. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. 
Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. And it goes on and talks about how close God is to his chosen people. His chosen people are the seed of Abraham. His chosen people are the seed of faith, the ones that choose to follow him, whether they be from the lineage of Ishmael or the lineage of Isaac. Jesus Christ came so that we could all be children of Abraham. So I pray that as you look at this study in chapter 16, that it will take you even farther and that you will see the blessing of God on his chosen people. Be blessed today.